everybody. We have Joe Whittacom here with us today to talk about the um, the B Improvement Plan. Well, it's it's really a UK thing, but it has relevance for Ireland, particularly when we focus on supporting our native bees and so on. So uh, without further, further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Joe. Away you go. Okay, thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, these Zooms are pretty good, but unfortunately I can't see my audience, which is a bit of a drawback, but never mind, I assume you're there. And uh, I will tell you about um, what we call the National Bee Improvement Programme, uh, which Bibber is launching. Um, and it actually, uh, we've had interest from Scotland, Wales, England, and we've we have informed Fibca and we have informed Nibs about what we're doing. So we're not sure if Ireland's in on this or not. But anyway, I'll tell you all about it and you can see what you think. <clears throat> um, so what I'll cover tonight is um, the geographical area of the programme, how the idea came about, why the National Bee Improvement Programme is needed, what it hopes to achieve, how the system will work, and how to participate. So what's this got to do with Ireland? Well, Ireland and Britain are really the same geographical region. We have the same subspecies of honeybee, um, and the bee is very closely related between Ireland and England. Uh, or England and Wales and Scotland, I should say, Ireland and Britain. We face similar threats to our bees. That's um, particularly biosecurity risks and genetic introgression from exotic imports. Um, I know some people like the exotic imports, but um, we'll discuss it a little bit later on. Um, Beowulf Cooper, who founded Beber in 1964, uh, recognise all the you know, recognise our links, should we say, between Britain and Ireland, and the links to particularly of the bees, and set up, set up an organisation to support the native bee. And Ireland actually exports quite a few native bees to England, as you probably know. Uh, Biber has communicated with Fibka and Nibs about this National Bee Improvement Program. Um, Right, let's have a look. Oh, this is an old Bibber leaflet from 1968, so it's over 50 years old. And even then they were talking about the native and near native bees of Britain and Ireland. So we have a lot of common links. Um, now, um, <clears throat> now Bibber was set up to include all this area and um, I think the National Bee Improvement Programme is available for beekeepers in this whole area if they so wish. Um, of course, it's called national, but it actually refers to several nation states, Scotland and Wales being some of them, and England and maybe Ireland. Um, and we would reflect that in the the logo, in the NAPBIT logo, we try to represent every nation that was involved. So we know England, Wales and Scotland are quite interested. Well, we've had beekeepers from those areas interested. We hope there'll be some from Ireland, but we don't, we don't no idea yet, so that's a bit of a question mark. And possibly the Isle of Man and Chell Islands. We're open to all those ideas, get it, all those areas getting involved in it anyway, if they so wish but we will see. Um, so how did the idea come about? Well, if you go back to 1992, uh, which is in modern times is the start of our troubles really when Varroa was discovered. We've had troubles before. We've had um, Isle of Wight disease, for example. But anyway, in 1992, we had Varroa discovered in England and pretty quickly it was discovered in other parts of England, Wales, and Scotland, and eventually Ireland. And the immediate effect was a decline in bees and beekeepers. 
there was a noticeable decline as soon as Varroa hit badly. Obviously, it, it killed stocks off. Beekeepers lost interest, and and we're on to a decline then for quite a while, probably a decade or so, of decline in beekeepers, decline in bee stocks, and um, probably. I expect the Irish Beekeeping Associations were the same as BBKA. They um, tried to draw the draw attention to the problem, um, and eventually, the English and Welsh government got together and drew up a healthy bees plan for two thousand nine to address the, the pro, you know address the issue to achieve a sustainable and healthy population of honeybees for pollination and honey production in England and Wales. And that was the aim of the plan. It's supposed to be a 10 year plan. In fact, you probably might be aware that they've just drawn up another one, um, <clears throat> which I think they've called Healthy Bees Plan 2030 or something, because it's for the next 10 years. Uh, the Welsh Agriculture Department were also involved and their, their remit, not just for honeybees, but for livestock in general, their interest in protecting and improving the quality of stock, which is very relevant, I think, to beekeeping as well. So, um, in the Healthy Bees Plan, it identified imports as a biosecurity risk to our bees. It's a possible source of infection, perhaps new infections or different versions of what we've got already. And it was a clear risk and since that time, imports into Britain, at least, have more than trebled, which is uh, incredible, really. <coughs> uh, although they pointed out the risks, nothing has been able to be done about it. And the problem has got worse, in effect. Um, I'm not sure about how many imports Ireland gets. It's a fraction of what we get into Britain, I know that. But it's still an issue. Um, and we're up to about 22,000 a year queens now. And that's, you know, it's dramatic year on year increase, really. Um, so DEFRA decided eventually they must try and address this issue. <clears throat> and they called together a few representatives from different groups, the National Beekeeping Unit and several beekeeping organisations. And they formed a queen rearing working group, which had a series of meetings. Um, they were on sort of uh, teleconference, I think. But anyway, we, I was involved. I, I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to join the group. And we tried to address the issue. How could we produce more home reared queens and therefore reduce the number of imports? Um, the Queen Rearing Worker Group tried to identify why imports are so popular and uh, they decided, well, one, they're readily, readily available, particularly early in the season. They're generally cheaper than what we can produce at home and some people like their quality. So issues of quality were also identified as a factor in why people liked imported queens. Now, that immediately raised issues because we cannot, because of our climate, we cannot produce them early in the season. Uh, probably they're dearer to produce it over here than in say the Mediterranean, where they can much more reliable weather and so on. But anyway, so given these advantages, uh, the only way they're gonna reduce it is if they can find a good reason for beekeepers to favor home reared queens. Well, that was my conclusion. They needed a good reason for beekeepers to favour home reared queens. Well, we know that um, the Colos group had pointed that out, that local queens actually, or local bees, are better in many respects. They're better survivors and so on. They're more, well, they're, they become locally adapted to conditions. And so that's a big plus point for local queens. <clears throat> Um, the Queen Rearing Work Group carried out a survey to try and find out more about beekeepers' attitudes to queen rearing and importing queens, because they felt that 
that was needed otherwise we didn't know where we stood and this was just in England by the way they only sent out the survey to beekeepers who were registered on bee base on the National Beekeeping Units register and they got 4,800 replies which was pretty good um, I think and it indicated I'm not because I was able to I was lucky enough to put forward a couple of questions which were put onto the survey and beekeepers indicated that they would prefer home reared queens to imported queens which is a good start and 80% of respondents said they would support an improvement program using the native bee which was an amazing figure we thought I was expecting something like 20 or 25% if we're lucky but there was a really positive response um, <clears throat> It didn't have much effect on the other members of the committee, unfortunately, but never mind. Um, the conclusion that was drawn by me, but and me alone, I think, was that a national improvement program based on our own stock of bees, rather than on imports, would provide an incentive to encourage the use of home reared queens. It would give people a reason if we could, if we had a program that was just focusing on our, on our native and or local bees. Um, instead of imports, that would be a very good reason for just not using imports because you did. We didn't want to keep adding new genes to the to the mix. Um, why is this relevant to Ireland? Well, Ireland has an important population of Apis mellifera and mellifera, as you know. I believe you're also threatened by imports or that that subspecies is threatened. Um, also not just the genetic threats, but of course, health threats as well. If we import bees, we're always in danger of bringing something in. We've seen it in other species. We've seen it in trees. Well, in this country, we've bought, happily brought ash, ash saplings in and happily imported ash dieback. I mean, it's, it's incredible, really, that people don't try to stop a problem before it happens. <clears throat> we, if we can get more beekeepers involved in improving the quality of their bees, that would be a good thing. That would be good in Ireland as well as in England, Wales and Scotland. Can get more beekeepers involved in raising new queens. And it's a programme, this is great for publicity because you can get everybody on board, get more people on board, reach more people, beekeepers in particular, but the general public can be made aware of it as well. So it could be a good thing all around. I'm aware you've got, um, you've got a few Bibber members and you've got Nibs, which is trying to protect the native bee, promoting the native bee. <clears throat> So this National Bee Improvement Programme is aiming to be an alternative to using imported bees. Um, it's an attempt to refine our honeybee population with the aim of reducing imports and improving the quality of our bees. Now, the areas across Britain and Ireland vary tre tremendously. The bees trem vary tremendously from one region to another. But those sort of aims can be, they can apply to all beekeepers, I think. Um, they're relevant to all beekeepers. So it's a proposal for a sustainable program of bee improvement. Biba is not proposing a ban on imports. Some people perhaps think they should be, but it is aiming to provide an alternative to imports. And proposing a ban on imports can have an can have a, a negative effect perhaps because it just um, works up, people are against it. You just end up having a slanging match, which isn't what we're trying to do. We're trying to apply ourselves positively and provide an alternative to imports. Now I'm just gonna um, give a couple of slides explaining a couple of things which are certainly relevant to many beekeepers in England and Wales and Scotland. And I think they're probably relevant to some beekeepers in Ireland too. Um, the fact is, hybrid vigour 
is um, something some beekeepers think is a wonderful thing. <clears throat> and it's certainly a useful thing in agriculture. We, it's used in agriculture a lot, in plant and animal breeding. And you can cross one subspecies with another or one breed with another. And you get hybrid vigor in the offspring. Now with something like a cow, it's, it perhaps makes sense because you can control the bull, you can control the cow, you can put what breeds you like together and there's no repercussions really. But <clears throat> on the seed packets, they use, if you bought an F1 seed, F1 hybrid seed, it say, used to say, do not save seed from this variety or something like that because they knew they wouldn't breed true after that. It's the same with any other animal and bees are even worse. Um, Brother Adam had great success developing the buckfast bee with, high, with its hybrid vigor. He liked to cross different subspecies and, and reap the reward of the hybrid vigor. The only trouble is <clears throat> what happened in the later generations I don't know if anyone can see that picture, I can't, because I've got my uh, pit, picture of myself in the way, but that's Brother Adam with me looking over his shoulder, <clears throat> trying to find out what it's all about. And the, in my early days of beekeeping, and that was it, the Matey Apri up on Dartmoor, and it was fascinating to go there. The bees were fantastic, and it was really great. But asking Brother Adam how we improve our bees basically. You buy, the answer is you buy in a buckfast queen, you rear queens from it, and they're great to start with, but as over the generations they go completely haywire, and then the answer is you buy in another buckfast queen to start the process again, and you've got to keep doing that. And to me that's not a sustainable system. Um, The mating of bees is very hard to control. Um, queen will mate with perhaps tw up to 20 drones quite commonly, and maybe more. Um, she, so we have very little control over those 20 drones. Um, we can do artificial or in instrumental insemination or um, isolated mating apiaries if you're lucky. And, you, and these systems work well, they can produce a good bee, but how long can you keep those qualities going? So <clears throat> hybrid bees are more trouble than with bees than in any other species, I would say, because of this mating system. And they just did generate into a random hybridized mix of subspecies. What's wrong with that? Some people think it's great because you've got genetic diversity, but it makes further selection improvement difficult. That's the fact of the matter. And that's the position most of us are in. We've got a random mix of bees around us and how do we deal with it? I know the situation isn't quite as bad in Ireland. You've got much stronger uh, roots in the native bee, shall we say, which makes your job a little bit easier, I think. So what about imported bees? Why are they such an issue? Are they an advantage or a problem? And some people think they're good, as I say, because it increases genetic diversity. But uh, there are risks and disadvantages. We've got the biosecurity risks. We had the Isle of Wight disease, and I know that was bad in Ireland too. Um, and that was almost certainly caused by, I would say, no evidence, I've got no evidence, but by bringing bees into this country with a disease that really reaped havoc with, with the native bee in particular. <clears throat> I don't agree with Brother Adam that it wiped it out, but it certainly had a pretty bad effect. A varroa was almost certainly brought in on imported bees. And at the moment there's questions about chronic bee paralysis for us. And how is that linked with, we got quite, there's some bad, quite bad cases of it in this country and is it linked to imported bees and then apart from the biosecurity risks continuous hybridization of subspecies 
Okay, some people argue that it increases genetic diversity, but bear in mind that if it's bringing genes in that aren't much use to us because they're not adapted to this climate, what good is that? And that is something that the Collis group pointed out. Maladapted, maladapted genes do not help. Um, <clears throat> and it's very difficult to select and improve from a hybridized population. So really, to my mind, we need to try and get try and work our way away from this hybridization. And then perhaps we can start improving things. Imports can produce short term improvement in quality, but the quality is only maintained with further imports. So it and they're reaping havoc as they go because of mixing up the bees. And to me, this is a sort of vicious circle that we've got ourselves into. So what have we achieved in 160 years of importing? Well, some people say, oh, we've had some really good bees, uh, but we've also had a tremendous amount of poor quality bees, the resulting mongrelization, if you like. A system of sustainable improvement has not been achieved. And that's the point. We need a system that's able to provide a sustainable improvement in our bee population. Now, bee improvement is what I try and practice. I select my breeder queens and I try and influence the quality of the drones in the area. Um, I'm not able to have a direct control of the drones because, as I say, the queens open mate and they mate with perhaps 20 drones. Uh, bee breeding is where you do have complete control over both sides and through instrument and insemination or isolated mediapiaries. And that has produced some good results. But what happens when you introduce those bees into an area? Okay, you might be all right for a generation or two, but then it's downhill all the way as usual. <clears throat> so we need to, the two systems can work together. And we start with bee improvement in an area, and then perhaps um, bees bred by bee breeding. If they're compatible, compatible with what we're using, uh, they can help to reinforce a strain. And I think they, that has a place, but bee breeding alone, I don't think does the job. So the endless hybridization of subspecies is not working. Can sustainable improvement be achieved? And uh, well, <coughs> I joined Biber about uh, 1989 or something, or 1998, or, and I enjoyed learning all the theory and understanding what the principles were behind it, if you like. It was only when I came to Ireland in 1996 to the Biber conference there that I was able to see it in action because of what the Galti Bee breeders had done. And that group showed me that actually it's a practical application, something can be done, something works. They were actually, I think there may have been one, two groups in England that had done quite a good job as well, but I was down in Cornwall. They were the first bees I'd seen actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, <clears throat> so the system needs to be self-supporting and maintained indefinitely, that is sustainable, is able to maintain or improve quality over successive generations maintains genetic diversity, but within a useful framework. And by that framework, I mean, well, I'll perhaps explain it in a second, encourages local adaptation. That is a population that is suited to and thrives in its environment. Aims to produce a hardy, docile and productive bee. And uses a system that produces a bee that can adapt and evolve to changing conditions. And I think this system can, because we're constantly selecting the bees that are doing best, that are most suited to our conditions. If conditions gradually change, we're still choosing the best ones that are coping with those conditions. So the bee is evolving as the conditions evolve. So it really makes sense in a sustainable system. So how can we implement a system that fulfills all those points? As you know, beekeepers are a partnership between the beekeeper 
and the bee. Both must benefit to be a sustainable system. And one rule we have set out, and we've kept it to an absolute minimum, because every rule you make is going to rule a few people out. And so what we're saying is participants should avoid the use of imported or the offspring of recently imported stock. You might think that's a bit too lax. That means people could be breeding from anything. But we believe that with the process of natural and artificial selection, it will always tend towards a bee that's most suited to its environment. And it will basically favor the native strain. The program is based on best available local stock built on natural and artificial selection. Nature selects for survival. The beekeeper selects for the qualities that he or she wants. And we're allowing stock to be brought in from others in the scheme. So that means um, People can bring in st local st stock that's fairly local to them. They can go further afield. Some people say, oh, 50 miles, is about 50 mile radius should be the limit. And some say it can be this anywhere really, as long as it's the same strain. And so we're allowing anywhere within that area that I show first showed you on the map, to, as long as it's the same or similar strain of B to be in used, it can really help an improvement program develop its strain. So how will the program work? Well, this is a good place to start. Record the performance of each colony's performance. Record, assess how the colony is doing. What's his temper like? How is it building up? Um, how readily does it swarm? How much honey has it produced? And, it, you know, Again, we're not laying down rules as to what people should record. We are issuing a guide and we'll also issue a, a record card that could be used, but you might want to use your own record card or you're, if you're in a group, you might want to decide what qualities you want to look for. And it'd be up to individuals and, individu and groups and so on to decide for themselves exactly what they want to do. We're not laying down the law in that respect. A suitable record card will be available for you. It's one, maybe several record cards, so people can pick and choose, or they might want to invent their own. <clears throat> the aim of record keeping is to allow the selection of breeder queens. Some people worry about that phrase breeder queens. I don't, because I think that's the best name for them. What it means is the queens that we're gonna, that are worth rearing further queens from. It might be one or two queens you rear from it. It might be half a dozen, or it might be numerous queens. Doesn't matter, it's still a breeder queen if you're rearing offspring, deliberately rearing offspring from it. So we can choose the best ones that we want to use. And, uh, and we can pretty quickly pick out the worst ones as well. The ones that perhaps shouldn't be here, the aggressive ones and so on. We perhaps requeen those and so on. And it's a process that you can just, by that record keeping, you can really start to improve what you've got. And if you want to take it a lot further, because we are a bit at the mercy of the drones, and some people say the key is the drones. Well, the key is actually in selection of the breeder queens. And I'll try and explain why. <clears throat> because the daughters, if I choose some breeder queens, and the idea is not to limit it to too few a number, because um, that way we may be reducing genetic diversity. So perhaps select more than one beta queen, several beta queens, maybe with the first year, you might only be able to find one that's worth breeding from, but so on. But we always want to keep the numbers up. Um, we're always conscious of the genetic diversity in our population, and that's got to be kept, kept high. Um, anyway, to go back to this, I select some breeder queens and I rear daughter queens from those breeder queens. I might be working in a group of beekeepers who've got more clout, they can do a lot more work between them and so on. Or I might be, <clears throat> I might be a commercial beekeeper who's already got lots of colonists and can do a bit more with them. Who knows? But um, the point about the daughters of the breeder queens is that 
no matter what they mate with, those the drones they produce are going to be good because they're from an unfertilized eggs. They're directly related to the breeder queens we chose in the first place. We chose those breeder queens for a reason. They had good qualities. So the drones are likely to pass on those good qualities. I'll show a diagram for that in a minute. So develop a system of breeding or mating zones in order to develop local strain. You want to be able to saturate a small area and you can saturate a small area with your type of bee and your drones. And then you get the best, most likelihood of getting a decent mating for your queen. As I say, it doesn't particularly matter in the first year because um, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. It's not because you have less control over the drones, but in your second and subsequent years, you have produced queens which will produce good drones. And this is an example, a bit of a diagram. This has caused confusion, this diagram. It's made people think I'm headed for inbreeding, but I assure you I'm not. Um, that there, it's just a representative. In you, when I select some breeder queens, it might be one, three, five, seven, ten. It's a number of breeder queens. Then I rear numerous queens from those, and they're going to mate with whatever the population is around you, whatever the local population of bees is. It may not be what you want, but they'll mate with anything. So they might be producing hybridized workers in there, but at least you know the drones they're producing are good, as I say, un from unfertilized eggs. So then year two, when I select another load of breeder queens and rear another load of queens, daughter queens, those daughter queens will, will can mate with the drones from my reared queens the previous season. So I'm starting to get better matings, is what I'm trying to say. And then the, you just carry on that process. You keep trying to improve an area. And anything you don't like in that area, you move out. And anything that's good, you keep in that area. And you can gradually build up a strain of bee, which is starting to have better qualities. And you're starting to get matings that are much more reliable. Right, we'll move on, because it's quite that's quite complicated, but it's a simple system that really works. It seems complicated on the face of it, but it's the system that I've used to transform my area from uh, a really hybridized area into something with a decent strain of B really. Selecting and improving from mixed stuff is, is difficult as bees do not breed true. Bee breeders recommend breeding within a so, oh, I don't know what it says, I can't read it. Within a something, subspecies or strain. Yeah, bee breeders do say that. Most bee breeders say that. Stick with the subspecies or a strain of bee. The only ones that perhaps disagree with that is buckfast bees, because buckfast breeders, because they believe in <clears throat> crossing the subspecies to get their hybrid vigor. And that does, doesn't come without issues. Um, and this is where I was trying to explain that framework. This is a book that came out recently and he, he, I quite like his definition. He says, selection is only possible within the framework of a well-defined population. For example, within a given race or a fairly low, large local population that will be disrupted as little as possible by the introduction of foreign bees. That's where we're trying to get to. And I think on the whole, you're probably much closer to that in Ireland than we are in, in many areas in Britain. Now, advantage of selecting from what we've got. Now, if you go back, if anyone was at the Biber conference in 1996, <laughs> if you're pretty ancient like me, you'll remember the catchphrase for that was, um, making the most of what we've got, that was it. And I really like that because it, it gave me hope. It was a different story to what Brother Adam was saying. He was saying, just keep buying in from him. And, but this making the most of what you've got is brilliant because it's, you've got to try and find some local bees and select and improve them. And uh, I like that attitude, I like that approach. 
and it reduces biosecurity risks. It avoids the continual introduction of new untested genes into the area. It, you end up, you gradually reduce the hybridization as the effects of natural and artificial selection shape the population. Bees start to breed true, results in more rapid progress. By selecting bees that do well in our conditions, we can develop a more locally adapted population. And there's enough genetic diversity in our bee population to se select any qualities we want. And people have said that to me, oh, you're going to, you know, you need imported bees to keep the diversity up. We don't. There's lots of diversity in the population. We just got to look after it and select and improve it. The system of open, open mating maintains genetic diversity. And the bee is quite well designed for that, I think. It, on the whole, it avoids inbreeding. I know the beekeeper can muck that up, but it's quite difficult to, to be honest. <clears throat> so that should be in pro program. Summary of the aims. All beekeepers can benefit from a sustainable system of bee improvement. Aim to provide an alternative to imports, thus reducing biosecurity risks. The improvement program will be based on stock that's already present. The combination of natural and artificial selection will allow us to develop a better quality bee. And that's as simple as it gets really. What's the common thread? Well, we're trying to appeal to all beekeepers. That's obviously an impossible task. As you know, beekeepers like to disagree with each other. Uh, we always like to well, I mean, we like to go our own ways. We like to set up alternative organisations and so on. I mean, even in Cornwall, we have two beekeeping associations, one in the West and one in the rest of it. I mean, we always like to divide ourselves up if we can. Our current population can be viewed as our available resources. Just think of that, our bees as our available resources. That's a good starting point. And through the applying the principles of natural artificial selection, our bees will be shaped by what is good for nature and good for the beekeeper. But we lay down one ongoing rule or principle. The improvement program will not use imported bees or the offspring of recently imported bees. Um, that isn't adding anything to what we need. And that bit leads to appeal to all beekeepers. So we recognize that we're all in different circumstances and different starting positions. And you can certainly see that in this country. And I, I hope it's not quite as bad in Ireland or nowhere near as bad with a bit of luck. Not going to dictate methods that must be used, but we will issue guidelines, what we think works, what we think is good and what we th think perhaps doesn't work. We will be doing that and we will be having an online guidebook. And in this guidebook, we will put, say, um, we'll, as I said before, we'll put a record card or more than one different system. We'll suggest methods of queen rearing for small time beekeepers and people who want to do more. And it will be an ongoing system uh, which can be constantly upgraded and added to as things come to light. So if one group reports back they've had fantastic success with this such and such a method, then that can be put on the, into the guidebook and then for others to use and so on. So it's an ongoing system that will build up. That's the sort of thing the guidebook will have and it should be helpful to anyone who's a bit unsure about things. And we all need a bit of guidance when we start and the best way to learn is to try and put things into practice and then you soon learn what's gone wrong and what, what isn't working. And you gradually move from being a beginner to someone who's got something that works. Um, and as I say, things can, it can be constantly updated forevermore, really. And it'll be a useful reference source. Right, now... So we're expecting um, people, we want the widest possible support. We know we're not going to get everybody behind it because we've all got different ideas, but we've kept it as 
broad as we can, and we think it will make help beekeepers go in the same direction. And we will eventually much more likely to reach a unified point, if you like. Small bee, scale bee, beekeepers can still select their bees. Um, and it just starts probably with assessing each colony and so on. It's even better if you can work in groups because you have increased influence, maybe a specific improvement group and maybe an association working together in an, perhaps an association a pre or whatever. <clears throat> Large scale beekeepers, perhaps commercial beekeepers, have got greater influence and they perhaps have the opportunity to produce queens for others to add to their improvement programs. And I stress that we don't just want people particularly taking queens and not doing anything to, to try and improve their own stock. We want it to be part of it, a bee improvement. Uh, the, that goes for the same for groups and group apiaries. They could produce surplus queens to supply to their local beekeepers, which will add to the program and help get things improved. And we also just want people who feel, well, I've got two hives in my garden, but I haven't really got any spare time to do anything else apart from look after those. We want passive supporters. We want people to think it's a good, a good idea, we support it so they can commit to avoiding imported bees, even if they can't actively partake in the scheme. So the focus of the programme will be on native bees, on near native bees, on long established local bees in an area. Now you might think that's a bit broad, but it allows any beekeeper, whatever their circumstances, to avoid the use of imported stock and take part in improving the honeybees in their area, which I think is a fantastic first step to improving the bees in, in the, our area, our areas. Now you can take part by either joining Bibber, because Bibber launched the scheme, they do want other associations to be involved with it, but at the moment it's just Bibber, <clears throat> £20 per year. I'm sorry it's not in euros, but I believe it's still £20 for, for the Irish as well by PayPal or bank transfer. Or you can supply, supply, sign up as a supporter of NatBIP for nothing. Just You've got to just go to the Bibber website. It'll tell you how to do it. You just leave your email address and you'll be kept fully up to date with all the developments and so on. And you'll be welcome. And you'll... I imagine you'll have access to the resources that go with it. Now, after that, I'm going to just show you a few slides for five minutes at the most, just for interest, to lighten things up a bit. <laughs> okay, what is a breeding strain? This is mostly photographs, but I've got a few things. Um, there's one or two slides coming in. That's what Beowulf Cooper defined it as. A strain is a group of colonies which show uniform or fairly uniform characters and breed true to type. The characters of parents and offspring are generally similar. There will be, obviously there's some variation, so that allows you to choose the best ones and go on to the next generation. It's a simple system. Uh, selecting and developing a strain, this is a matter of interest. This is what was found in, uh, I think it says the UK average, but actually I think the samples all came, I think they all came from England and Wales, I might be wrong about that. And that was from right across the country, completely random. Some of these samples may have been very recently imported, so they may have had practically no native bee in them at all. But the average came out as 45% native bee, which we in Bibber at that time, when this came out, we thought that's pretty good because we thought there was practically no native bee in many of our bees, but there's actually a lot more native bee around than you think. And in Ireland, I would imagine that figure's a lot higher <clears throat> than 45%, um, which means it's a fantastic resource to start with. And um, so we've got a very mixed population and it's gonna stay mixed while we keep importing so many bees. 
if we get away from a bit of imports, it will start to homogenize a little bit. The un unwanted genes or the unsuited genes will die out to a large extent. And that, I would say that my native fraction will increase. <clears throat> so what, when I started, I'd, once I'd realized a few things, I decided to select the native strain in my bees and I picked the ones that were most native looking there and I assess colonies by their appearance on a one to five scale, five being uh, their uniform native appearance. And that seems a very rough and ready system because we were, we were also doing morphometry. Morphometry was coming in about in the nineties, early nineties and uh, I tried it a few times and I was amazed to find a colony that was came out quite well on that. It didn't wasn't perfect by any means, but it just I was amazed because at that time they were all saying Brother Adam was still in fashion and saying everything had died out. And we didn't think and they were saying, Oh, there's native bees in Ireland, there may be a few in Scotland and a few in Wales, but then you're not going to find them anywhere else. And so when we found them in Cornwall, it was very exciting. <clears throat> and um you know, you can that native that assessment by appearance is one thing, but you can you can do DNA analysis if you can afford to have it done. And much, some of mine have been tested like that, and they come out pretty good. And and this is a simple sort of record sheet that we would use. And I this is what I use. Well, I just assess for the minimum number of qualities, which is basically five. Um, you won't be able to see it very clearly, probably, but native appearance, temper of the colony, this, uh, how likely they are to swarm or are they making swarming preparations, perhaps we should say. So when I see queen cells, that will be marked down. And if, I don't, if they go through the whole season with no swarm cells, uh, that will be marked up. Next column is basically health, but it's also brood pattern and overwintering. In the spring, I over mark them for how they've come through the winter. And it's a good trait. If they come through nice and strong, I like that. And I like to see a good, strong brood pattern with nice, healthy brood. And so they're all things I'm looking for. And then I, I note the honey, honey yield as well. So that helps me select my breeder queens. Anyway, these are some Cornish bees and they're probably similar to the Irish ones. Um, of course, bees appearance varies even in the native strain. Um, but this is what they look like, the sort of uh, browny, gingery, yellow hairs around the thorax, especially in the sunshine, and a thin light coloured stripe on the abdomen, and just generally dark abdomens. And that's one of the queens we reared. She's, they don't all come out like that. They're, that's a nice colouring, I like that one. Um, some of them are more banded, shall we say, and they'd be brown and black brown bands and apparently so I've been told by Polish beekeepers that can still be the mellifera strain but and then I look when I'm assessing them I look at the bees on the comb look at the workers and see how many of them have got yellow bands and so on and they look pretty good to me they're pretty uniform so that would probably be a five Queen rearing, well, this is how we've been doing it. We made our queens in these. Well, this is how we reared the queen, but this is more how we make the queens. We use these six frame uh, mini plus nukes, I think they call them, from, uh, oh, I forget the name, from near York anyway. Um, and they, we found them really helpful. Uh, we were using apodeas and some other ones like that, but. I've gone on to these slightly bigger ones and I find it great because we can actually overwinter queens in these. And usually we double the brood boxes up for overwintering, but uh, it's revolutionized our thing really. I know you can overwinter apodeas, but it is quite a hassle. And so we come through the, in the spring with ready to go again. As soon as we've reared some queens, we've, we've got the nukes ready, so it's nice. And that's that. Um, Dominating an area. Well, this is where I, I'll select an area. How do you dominate an area? Select an area that you can dominate with good drones. And you probably all know the story of the Goldie bee breeding group how you, <coughs> with a V, 
valley, I believe it was. And they started at the top of the valley and gradually worked their way down, and which is brilliant because they use the topography. I mean, I use, I'm on the coast, so I can use that to help me a little bit. You might find areas where there's low population of people or particularly beekeepers, and you might be able to find it more easy to dominate that area for, for mating of queens. And I believe there are mate mechanisms that favour the native bee for, for mating. And uh, we're pretty sure native drones and queens mate in cooler conditions, which certainly helps uh, in your favour if that's what you're going for. Um, and we certainly think they they don't rely on drone congregation areas, which are told is the only way queens. But I've been told categorically that's the only way queens mate. But that was from European beekeepers who slightly different conditions. They get more settled summers and so on, hot summers, whereas we get fairly cool summers. Um, and the bees still seem to mate. The queens mate. Unless it pours around for two weeks, then they might struggle. But uh, they generally make pretty well. And um, that's when I live in uh, southeast Cornwall, right opposite Plymouth. And we've got Plymouth Sound, which is the water between us and Plymouth. And we've got the sea around the sort of southeast and southwest of us. So it's quite a nice area for trying to build up a strain in. And that's what I've done quite fairly successfully. It's not never perfect. There's, there are other beekeepers in the area. Most of them try to keep the native bee, but there's always someone who will bring in something else. So it's never perfect, it doesn't matter. You keep going and you keep trying to improve all the time. And if you get some bees that make poorly, well, you can take them out of the area or you can at least take the next generation out of the area because you, you know the first generation, the drones are gonna be all right. And there we are. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. I don't know if, if there's any questions. Oh, that's the book I wrote about basically my how I did it, so to speak. Uh, yes, right, Brendan, over to you. Okay, we've got a few questions. Okay. Uh, not too many. Um, uh, as a beginner, how would I know uh, whether my own black bees, uh, AMM, are purebreds or genetically tainted by imports? Yeah, the only way you will really know it probably is DNA testing. And I said I'd had some of my bees done, uh, but uh, I didn't pay for it. <laughs> someone got some funding and did it. And I'm sure you can do the same in Ireland, probably get some funding and someone can do some testing. But it is it's still an expensive pro, pro uh, project, should we say. But there are moves afoot all the time to get cheaper ways of doing it. I believe the Roslyn Institute is really working on that at the moment, how to get cheaper testing for bees. Um, because my bees evolved from hybridized bees, and I just kept trying to purify the strain, if you like, I kept moving out the worst ones from the area and keeping the best ones in the area. I mean, <clears throat> I've been accused that I will get inbreeding, but I've never seen any evidence of that. Um, to be honest, I'm, I know it's, it's important, very important from a conservation point of view, how pure your bee is. But from my point of view, as a trying to improve the qualities of the bee, I'm not so worried. If someone said, that, oh, that's got a few genes of something else in, which it probably has, I wouldn't worry. The way, main thing I'm worried about is whether they breed true or not. And basically they do. So the offspring are roughly like the parents. And that's the crucial thing to me. When, I, when it was all hybridized bees, you, you just can't make any sense of the breeding. You, you don't, the offspring are all over the place. They're all different qualities. There's no consistency, but now there's more consistency and that's what I'm looking for. Okay. Yep. Uh, just a comment on that is uh, Jack Hassett did a paper which is published on, uh, in the IBRA there a couple of years ago on Irish genetic, bee, uh, bee genetic. Yeah. And um, he actually uh, did DNA analysis for quite a few people here in Ireland. And my own bees were all over 90%. Yeah. And, and I think that was common. That's amazing. I mean, that is fantastic. Because um, 
I mean, some of my bees have come out at that rate, but it has taken a lot of effort to get there. And if you do a general background bee in, in Britain, you know, they'll be way, way lower than that, that's for sure. So you're very lucky to have good bees and you can really work with them and get good results. Okay, next question is, how are you going to know whether Ireland is interested in this programme? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, thank you for asking it, because um, the answer is I don't know. No, I, I, do, I do really, but uh, I think the best thing you could do is go onto the Bibble website um, and register your interest, basically. And uh, I mean, we, <clears throat> we certainly don't want to tread on any toes. And we do want participation from the different areas of Britain and Ireland. We do want them to help organize. We, and obviously NIBs are, are at the forefront of this in Ireland. Um, and at the moment it's been left to, should we say it's in the hands of the Bibber committee. Um, Bibber has managed to get representation from Scotland, Wales and England. But it's very sad we've got nobody from Ireland there. We'd love to have somebody from Ireland, if not more than one person. And we'd love to work closely with Ireland and Ireland can obviously do their own thing. But I think the programme makes sense for all of us. I hope it does, because that's the aim of it. And we all want to work together on this. I mean, that, that's what I would like to see. And I don't want to see anyone, anyone dominating it or, you know, it's dominated by one country or another. Um, we've we're getting a logo designed and we hope to have the individual countries represented on each logo. So the beekeepers who are involved in it in Wales can put the NatBip logo with probably have Cymru or something on it. And uh, an Irish would have, a, if there's people interested in Ireland, they would have their own logo to use for Ireland and same with Scotland and so on. And we all have to obviously tread very carefully because we're all sensitive to our different uh, identities and so on and we're very aware of that and we don't nobody wants to tread on anyone else's toes and I think it's important we don't. Thanks, Brenda. Um, let's see everybody everybody in the three to five mile radius should have the same queen genetics and all people put together and only breed from from queens that you know from one set of queens that should be a starting point I think it's just more common to yeah, that, that's a pretty good comment, actually, because that's basically what I'm trying to do. Um, it, it doesn't need, I mean, they say drones fly up to six miles, but it's pretty rare, I think. To be honest, um, I, I only really got good saturation in, a, say, a three mile radius, three to four mile radius at best. And we get pretty good matings uh, most of the time. We do get the odd duff mating and so on, some queens, but it doesn't matter. We just, what we do is I move those further afield and I know they're putting out good drones, so they're still serving a purpose and it's great. But I'm just trying to keep the best looking ones and best quality ones in, in the immediate area from where I mate all those nukes. Um, okay, this is a pretty clear one. Do the drones not get killed off in August and would not be available for year two mating? No, uh, sorry, that's, a, that's okay. That's a good point. I think it's, uh, it's a reflection on my explanation. Uh, we rear the queens in one season, and those queens will probably be in, in nukes initially, and then they'll be in full-size colonies in the following season. In that following season, they're going to be building up full-size colonies. They're the queens I reared last year, and they're, they're um, now producing full-size colonies and producing drones, good drones, which will make with the queens I rear in that current season, if you see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> do you think we're already infested with all the main diseases that honeybees can have in general? What other risks of diseases from imports are there that we don't already have plaguing our own native bees? For example, we already have varroa, so imports with more yeah. varroa can't really be classed for this. How about, yeah, it's a good point. How bad can it, how much worse can it get than what we've got already? <clears throat> I'm told by experts that there are quite a few different strains of different diseases, and some of the strains we wouldn't have. We know small hive beetles are pest in Italy, 
and we're happily imported from Italy, bringing in bees from Italy. And they say, oh, it's OK, because they're not in that part of Italy. But it's never that OK. We're taking a gamble. Um, you know, and they, we think uh, this, I don't know if you've had it in Ireland or not, but in many areas of England and what, Wales and Scotland, I think, they've had a quite bad outbreaks of chronic bee paralysis for us. And there's a theory that it's a different strain to what we've had already, because it seems more virulent. And there's also a theory that it was brought in, or is being brought in on imported bees. But I don't think that's proved, I'm not, I don't know if it's been proved beyond that. I don't think it has, but that's one of the theories. And that can happen, you see. And of course, there's the tropical lapse, which hasn't got here yet. That's right. Uh, and I know it's, um, oh, Sammy, what's his name? We did all the work in the rural. Um, he, he's now working on that. And he said that the speed of their spread is staggering. Oh, no. And he expects it to be in Europe in a couple of years. Exactly. That's frightening, isn't it? Yeah. It is frightening. And we're just gambling, I think. We're gambling by thinking imports are fine. Uh, I don't know why we want to take the risk. I mean, when Isle of Wight disease appeared, that was devastating for beekeeping. And Varroa was devastating as well. We we're just waiting for the next devastation to turn up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is there a beekeeper's charter in Britain? And if so, who has the responsibility to monitor it? In Ireland, we have one, and one point in it declares that you, you be aware of the type of bees in your area before setting up an apiary. No, I don't think we have anything like that in England. We're very backward in that respect. Um, people are uh, very easily, um, they're very easily upset by any suggestion that they shouldn't import bees, any hint of that, and so on. We haven't a beekeeper's charter. We probably could do with one, to be honest. Actually, here we're, we're probably blessed in that most beekeepers keep AMM. There are, there are, you know, down the southwest and in Leitrim, there are large numbers of, of uh, buckfast, and that's fine. I mean, but but the rest of the country is pretty uniform. Yeah. Great. Um, and that's really a, an envious position for us over here, because you don't have to go many miles from here to find some, well, so far removed from native bees, it's unbelievable. But um, we th we are hanging at great hopes on this improvement program, and we think a lot of people will come on board, and we really hope so. And it, it will give publicity against importing bees. And I know it won't have a much effect on some of the bigger importers, but we hope it will have an effect. Um, so the last question here is: Are you aware of the Irish Bee Conservation Project based on Porter House and Gardens in County Cork? Its purpose is to protect all native species of bees, not just honeybees, but including only A and M. No, I wasn't aware of that particular project. I, um, but obviously it's a great thing, yeah, really good. Yeah. Actually, I've got a question for you about um, open mating. I use open mating all the time. What about instrumental insemination? It's something that seems to be a way of getting queens mated quickly and accurately and could help with the with the distribution of queens? Um, <clears throat> I have never done it. I've always relied on open mating. I think there's a place for it for people who want to do it. Um, hundreds of people buy instrumental insemination sets and very few get round to actually mastering it. But those that do master it make good use of it and that they do it is a help and it can definitely be a help, I think, to an improvement program. Um, but what I, um, as far as I'm concerned, I've, it, you can achieve a lot just for an open mating system. And that's, that's for the ordinary beekeeper, if you like, who hasn't got any special skills, yeah. which I class myself as. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it is frustrating when the, when the queens don't mate. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Okay, and that, that's all the questions. So, okay, thank you very much, Joe. It was very well, interesting. Nice uh, to talk to you. And I, hopefully, we can get to the point where, uh, you know, where people agree about which bees they, they need to need to to breed with. Yeah, and I I hope there will be some interest from Ireland. It would be fantastic if we could include include Ireland in the program. Um, but we'll see. Yep. So thank you for listening to me and. 
Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Good night.